Thank you for sharing with us the leaders who have influenced your life. And I was wondering if you could share with us an example of a situation in your experience uh, at Goldman Sachs or at the New York Fed when you also had to demonstrate true leadership. Thanks. I'm always afraid when people ask me that question. <laughs> Because no matter what you say, it's going to sound self-serving as hell. Uh, I, I guess um, I guess the one story—it's not a story. But the one that's far enough back that I I can mention it um, without again hopefully sounding unduly self-serving. Uh, was the time of the 1987 stock market crash. Uh, as, as you know, I was president of the Fed then. And you know, everybody, uh, when they talk about the 87 stock market crash, you kind of forget. You know, we had a one-day decline of basically 25% in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. One day, 25%. That was pretty scary. And that was a Monday. Uh, but what was really scary was Tuesday. Um, because, you know, if things didn't settle down. So the, the Fed, and now it's Alan Greenspan as chairman. Uh, we came up with some ideas and, among other things, just swamped the system with uh, liquidity. Uh, and early that Tuesday, uh, the stock market uh, began to recover. Uh, but at, as I, best I can recall, Joe, 10.30 in the morning, I think, that Tuesday, the stock market started to decline again, and it went into a very steep decline. And, you know, that was, those were very nervous times. And. Everybody in the world had an idea about what to do. And by 11 o'clock that morning, uh, the prevailing view of what to do in both Washington and New York was uh, to close the stock market down um, uh, that morning. And I thought that was not a very good idea. And I remember uh, for reasons that were just coincidental, uh, there was uh, Chairman Greenspan was in Dallas, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, the Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. There was no one in the economic team, senior level economic team, actually in Washington that Tuesday morning. So I got a call, and I don't mind telling this story because the person I'm about to uh, has told the same story many times. Uh, Howard Baker, again, for those of you who are old enough may remember Howard Baker, senator from Tennessee from the Watergate hearings. You know, what did the president know and when did he know and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Baker uh, was Ronald Reagan's chief of staff uh, in 1987. So, Howard Baker called me, and never met the man, never spoke to the phone. And he says to me, you know, everybody's telling me that you know, we should close the stock market, but they're also telling me that uh, you're opposed to that. Why are you opposed to it? <laughs> I don't know whatever possessed me to do this, but without thinking, probably in retrospect, could have done it a different way. I said to him uh, in a flash, because if you close the goddamn thing, you're going to have to figure out how the hell to open it. <laughs> 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 he, I apologize for the goddamn. <laughs> I'm disappointed you weren't <laughs> <laughs> So he paused for a minute. And he said to me, well, he says, you're the guy on the front line. I will 
respect what you said. But don't forget, <clears throat> if you're wrong, you're history. <laughs> <laughs> and so we didn't close the stock market that morning. But I must tell you, for the balance of that day and several days, if not weeks to come, I felt like I had swallowed a watermelon <laughs> because I was so nervous about <laughs> what if I was wrong? So anyway, that, that's one example. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. Um, thank you very much. This has been wonderful. Um, I'd like to ask you more about leading and managing on a day-to-day -day basis, um, like a lot of people in this room probably have to do. Um, and uh, particularly at Goldman Sachs, um, <clears throat> well, Goldman Sachs and bankers in general are being vilified by, uh, by our president, and, and, and maybe rightly so, but also by, by Main Street, and there's this populism out there. So how do you manage and lead, or how, how, how does one manage and lead within a firm like Goldman Sachs on a day-to-day -day basis where you have to take care of your employees, how they feel about what they're doing, they're take, you expect them to take care of their clients and keep their eye on the ball. And in this environment, you know, what, what are some tips in how to do that? I suppose a lot of people in here could use those tips. Well, the starting point uh, I used this word once before, and I'm going to use it again. The, the starting point is to retain a lot of humility on your own part. Um, because uh, being realistic, and no matter whether you think that uh, some of these political developments uh, are justified or not, uh, they probably are. We've been through an absolutely terrible couple of years. And as bad as they have been, uh, were it not for people like Chairman Bernanke and Hank Paulson and Tim Greitner, believe me when I say they would have been a hell of a lot worse. Um, we have thousands, millions of people being foreclosed on their homes. We have 10% unemployment and 17% underemployment. And, you know, as a human being, uh, you have to take stock of those realities. And you have to take stock of the fact that in those circumstances, uh, there is going to be a, a sense of legitimate anger, frustration, et cetera, uh, given these realities. And I think the worst thing that you can do in terms of day to day is to forget those realities, uh, because they're there. Um, now, in a, in a more, uh, more direct light, um, again, I mentioned the word patience before. You have to be patient. Uh, and you have to try and instill on your coworkers, especially younger coworkers, patience. Uh, you can't delude yourself into thinking that you have an answer for every criticism, whether the criticism is, is valid or not. And I think that especially with young people, uh, getting that message across uh, is, is, I think, one of the first and most important principles of helping them uh, to understand uh, the circumstances and the environment uh, in which you're in. I think this, the second thing beyond patience, I, I do think that um, this is true for a lot of organizations, but I do think despite all the criticism, it's, it's very true about Goldman Sachs. And that is, uh, if an organization uh, has its own distinctive culture, uh, one of the first things you do, even before things go bad, is again, you try to work, especially with young people, and help them to understand you know, the, the culture of the organization, uh, the way people work together, the benefits of teamwork, uh, the openness uh, with which you deal with problems, even small problems, may occur. 
And I think if you have a measure of success to begin with and helping people to grasp that culture, as this culture is another one of those great intangibles, of course, uh, when things do go wrong, uh, it's, it's much easier uh, to be able to work with people, to hold hands if necessary with people, figuratively, of course, uh, for them to be able to see through some of these things. And last, but certainly not least, you have to be honest. Uh, you know, you can't snow the snowman. And so, you know, when issues to take <laughs> the obvious one of compensation uh, is, is so prominently uh, an issue, you have to be honest with people and help them to understand why it is. And you have to be prepared to make changes in the way that you do things that are responsive to these legitimate public concerns. So I don't, again, I don't, I can't give you a cookbook, um, but I think those uh, three or four things are at least the, the, the basic ingredients of how one deals with difficult times. And I would submit that uh, for, I think, most any organization, uh, that is going through difficult times, whatever the circumstances, uh, those, those ideas, I think, have some legitimacy as a general matter. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, one, uh, more. one more question. Sir. Thank you very much. I'm most appreciative of your talk. Uh, as someone who has experience with those years you described, but. I wonder if you would care to comment based on your observation. Uh, who among us today that leads us would fit the kind of description that you've made <laughs> of leaders? I, I, I realize this is a uh, perhaps a risky question for you, but as someone who sits and watches the world, I, I'd like to at least look at some of those that you might think are leaders and, with respect. I, I thought I was. Very careful and judicious in talking about the past. Uh, so I guess I'm inclined to answer your question by saying Peyton Manning. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I'm, just not gonna go there. <laughs> I'm surprised you picked Peyton Manning. I like your common denominator by the hockey players. Uh, Canadians would agree with you. That's where the real leadership qualities really come from. Uh, I'd like to invite Father McShane uh, to uh, help in the presentation of our uh, first uh, a small token of our appreciation, Thank Jerry, and uh, our citation. Father? <laughs> what exactly is this? Whatever you'd like. This is, this is this is a pen on the floor, and it's a Tiffany pen. It's not mine. Uh, uh, it's plastic. Okay. So, uh, did you lose? Is this yours? No, oh. it's Yours? It was on the floor. Now, there's leadership. You know that uh, a Tiffany pen means nothing to the graduate school dean. You know this is clearly we have to look at your compensation, as Jerry, as Jerry has just suggested. Compensation is an important thing. Uh, Jerry, you know how highly we think of you. Uh, you are one of our great heroes, and I mean that. You are for us, uh, I think, the embodiment of many of the characteristics, indeed all the characteristics, that you described uh, as being the characteristics of a true and great leader. Uh, among the many things that you bring to the table wherever you are, I would cite only two. One is three. One is sheer brilliance which you wear in an off-handed off sort of way. I would think of you as kind of the Columbo of brilliant people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I gotta stop you there for this. <laughs> I, I, I gotta, I gotta. Columbo. Uh, I, I have this Columbo thing. I mean, this is it's, 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 it's really funny that you mentioned this. Not too long ago, mm -hmm. uh, I had a pair before one of the special committees in, in the House of Commons mm -hmm. in the UK. And you know, it was raining, it was a terrible day. 
So I've come out of the parliamentary building mm -hmm. and I'm trying to find a driver to take me back to the office. And it's, it's raining and I've got this trench coat on. <laughs> There's a big picture that appears on the front page of the Financial Times the next day with a reference to Colombo. There you go. <laughs> and I didn't even read the FT that day. Uh, that's the first. The second is uh, everyone who knows you say that you have the rare and most, I think, important quality, and that is you're a man of unquestioned and deep integrity. And it is for that reason, I think, that you led the New York Fed with such, I think, solid wisdom and inspired, I think, the confidence of the whole financial community. People knew you were brilliant. They knew you were a man of unquestioned uh, integrity and principle. And the third is, uh, it goes back to the Colombo comment, which I will never apologize for. <laughs> I kind of like it. I do too. <laughs> In spite of these great qualities, you're a man of great humility. And I suspect that's one of the reasons why not only have you been throughout your career a great leader, but you've been a great mentor for emerging leaders because you have been free enough in your humility to recognize and nurture those who have gifts that you see even before they see them and appreciate them themselves. So for these reasons, Jerry, you really are one of our greatest heroes here at Fordham. We want you to know that. We hope that you'll come back often, stay long, speak with wisdom and authority uh, frequently to our students and to all of us here because we really benefit from you every time that you come. And we give you this citation, which is already framed, so you can uh, bring it to Goldman. Uh, <laughs> and, but knowing you, you won't. This will become part of your collection of unexhibited testimonials to your brilliance, your integrity, and your great, I think, empowering humility. So Jerry, thank you, and congratulations. <laughs>